He might have had some meaning before, but now it's all times are different, it's all wrong. Apparently, the age and focus of the Bible have not become all that irrelevant. It's still the best-selling book of all time, the best-selling book of the year, every year. <laughs> 20 million copies of the Bible were sold in 2016. 92% of all Americans own at least one Bible, and two-thirds of them say it holds the meaning of life. Unfortunately, not everyone reads the Bible, and that may be the reason some think it would be irrelevant. But where else can you find in eight verses, seven verses, as we read this morning, where can you find in seven verses, seven sentences, practical and consistent solutions to the recurring problems of life? Common personal problems. What self-help book, psychological journal, has existed and been a source of help for 2,000 years? Only the Bible. Today we're going to look at these seven verses of Scripture that hold as much relevance to you and me today as they did when they were first written. In fact, they hold as much relevance as they did to anyone anywhere in the world at any time in the world. In Philippians 4, 1-7, the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God tells us how to deal with two recurring personal issues that affect us all. The problem of interpersonal relationships and the problem of persistent anxiety. I'll say interpersonal, interpersonal conflict because personal, interpersonal relationships are not always a problem. But when there's conflict, there is. And we can have joy in the midst of these struggles. Paul begins this passage by affirming the foundation for success in long-term problem solving. Verse 1, as I read it before, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and crown in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. You notice the affection in this verse? The great apostle, the worldwide traveler, the courageous defender of the gospel for all, says to the small struggling fellowship, you are my beloved brethren. You are my longed for. You are my fellowship. You are my joy, my crown, my beloved, he repeats. That's some great motivation, isn't it? And what does he say the church should do? Stand firm. Don't be moved off course. Don't go back. You see, there are enemies all around. We talked about that last week. Chapter 3, verse 18 speaks of them. False Christians, in fact, who are adversaries of the gospel. The basis for standing, the location of standing, the means of standing, the lo- and the, uh, the, all there is to do with standing has to do with the Lord. Only in the Lord Jesus Christ will we have success in dealing with recurring problems. Chapter 3 was full of teaching. It's all about theology. Paul now moves into practice in chapter 4. He starts with the, verse, with the word, therefore. We can stand firm in the Lord. We can put into practice the truth that we've heard. And we just learned why we should follow Christ. Now, let's do that. That's what he's getting to in chapter 4. Ever since man existed, there have been conflicts. Man blamed woman, woman blamed blamed the serpent, Cain was jealous of Abel. The problem is repeated over and over and over again all through scripture. Conflict might be either substantive or interpersonal. Substantive conflict occurs uh, over ideas and facts and, and values. Interpersonal conflict is a result of disharmony on a personal relational level. The good news is the Creator knows how to fix the problems of His creation. Here's a plan in these verses, as we begin, to resolve interpersonal conflict. It's not an exhaustive plan, but will provide the basic help for those desiring to maintain unity unity among themselves and in the church. This plan will provide basic help to maintain harmony. When this letter arrived in Philippi, It was read aloud to the church. There was no doubt about who was causing trouble among the church when when the letter was read. Verse 2 says, I urge Euodia and Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Imagine them sitting there in the congregation when the letter arrives. We got a new letter. We got a letter from Paul today. Let me read it for you. 
See, Paul doesn't have any, doesn't have any, uh, any problem with talking about these personal issues. Not that we're going to get up in front and tell everybody whose personal problems we have. That's not the point. But the point is that unresolved conflict can destroy the church, and this is how, this is why Paul addresses it head on and boldly. What if the women were offended? Well, they might have been. But it's obviously they weren't doing, it's obviously when we continue reading this, they weren't doing the right thing. And Paul realizes the importance of the unity of the church is, is, uh, is above beyond, above what, uh, what individuals may continue to argue about. And the conflict among these women was especially critical. They were a vital part of the church. They were among the well-known frontline workers, the ones who were fighting for the gospel. And the problem was not their lack of involvement, it was their lack of unity. You notice as I read this, they were united, verse, verse 3 says, they were united in the important issues of Christ and the gospel, even outspoken about them. But something had happened at a personal level to, to bring a rift between these two ladies. We need to remember this. There will always be substantive a disagreement between believers and unbelievers. There will always be arguments, or not arguments, there will always be disagreement about, about our, our views of the Bible, there will, about our views of salvation, about our, uh, 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 our theology, of, about our views of Jesus Christ and who he was. And in fact, the Bible tells us this. Do not be yoked together with unbelievers, for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Believers live by a different standard than unbelievers. We're not trying to make trouble. That's not the point either. It's just that we have different views than the people around us. And we can't agree on everything. And the primary substantive issues about the Bible and who is God and how to worship Him, how to get to heaven, there will be no unity with followers of Christ and non-Christians. But that does not have to lead to overt conflict. We can have unity, we can never have unity of spirit with those who do not believe the gospel. So how do we respond in those situations? What are we supposed to do with people outside the faith who disagree with us. Here's what Paul says to the Colossian church. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. We deal with non-believers. We don't deal with them in, a non -argumentative way, in an argumentative way. We don't try to make trouble. We love them. We get along with them. We do what we can to help them on a personal basis, serve them in any way we can, but just remember, we, we, we won't agree on everything. Nor do we have to have interpersonal conflict with believers. That's why Paul's writing this. We all stand firm as believers on the same foundation in the Lord. Unity grows from our individual commitment to follow the Lord, to be submissive to the Lord. Christ is our common denominator. So how can conflict be resolved when it does happen? Well, here's how we can restore unity when there's relational conflict. Let me read verses 2 and 3 again. I I'll, I'll urge these women to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, comrade, true companion, I ask you also to help those women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement and also the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. We don't know how this conflict began. Paul doesn't take sides. He appeals the same way to each. I urge Euodia. I urge Syntyche. It's a gentle exhortation. Please, women. Please, Euodia. Live in harmony. Please, Syntyche. Live in harmony. He's making a, a, a compassionate appeal. The first step toward reconciliation in, is for both sides to commit to unity. Live in harmony. That's the, fir that's the first step that Paul gives us in order to establish and reestablish uh, broken personal relationships. Paul explained how unity is established in chapter 2. He said, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind, 
maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty deceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Unity is built when each believer is committed to the Lord first and the best interest of other believers on the same scale as his own. See, Paul is moving these two women toward square one. Please, ladies, both of you think the same way. Regard your ministry partner's interests, not your own. And unity will prevail when we each make others more important than ourselves. Unity will prevail when we each make others more important than ourselves. In this case, perhaps because of the conflict was so marked and so well known, Paul enlists an outside mediator. Verse 3 talks about a true companion, a loyal yoke fellow. Who is this person? Well, I found nine possible suggestions. Some people think it's Paul's wife. Well, he tells us in 1 Corinthians he wasn't married, so I don't think that's the case. Maybe his brother. We don't know anything about Paul's brother. Someone suggested it might be the husband of one of the women. Any of you men want to enter into that? No. Some people say Silas, Epaphroditus. Someone even suggested it was Christ. Well, Christ is at the basis of everything, but... Well, we may not know who this loyal yoke fellow is, and it's not necessarily important for us to do that. But one thing is sure, the Philippians knew who it was. This church knew exactly who he was talking about. In fact, if I can offer my, my view on this, I think his name is right here in the text. The Greek word for this title, yoke fellow, companion, in verse 3, is syzygis. Now you see, that's a strange name. So is Yodius and Syntyche. Anybody know anybody in, in, in your neighborhood with those names? If you had the name of Yodius when you were growing up, somebody would probably, call you, would probably say, you're odious. Or if your name was Sintichi, they'd say, Sintuchi. You know, I only have, I'm a singular button, but you know how many people call me buttons? So it, it's easy to make, but, but at any rate, we have this, we have this word, which translated true companion. Paul names Euodius, Syntyche, and Clement. None of their names are translated into English, translated to, to the word meaning. What if the Greek word syzygis was a name? And Paul calls upon him to step in and help. Syzygis, please help these two. These women needed help in reconciling, didn't they? Paul asks assistance from a respected church leader whose name describes exactly what they need. They need to be yoked together. And a, name, and a man named Yoke Fellow, joining companion, is called to help. And Paul does another very helpful thing in verse 3. He reminds the women and all who listen of their first priority. You have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Acts 16 narrates the history of the church of Philippi. The first convert in Philippi was Lydia, and the early converts of the church were women. It's likely that these two women, Yodius and Syntyche, were charter members of the church. Paul reflects on their original struggle in the gospel. You women helped me when I came to Philippi and preached the gospel. You were part of the basis of the church. They worked side by side like teammates in, a, in an athletic competition. That's the sense of this word. Ensuring that the gospel message was proclaimed and, and preached after Paul left. And now they were alienated and ineffectual. They had lost their focus. Paul brings them back to the proper focus. The gospel. The gospel is always the priority. He calls them back to that priority. Christians are united together in the Lord for the gospel. And once again, as in 321, we're reminded of what is in store for us. Those whose names are in the book of life. We have a real hope in this life. And Paul reminds these women in all the church what our destiny is as believers. Let's not lose that focus. The gospel is the means by which we get to heaven. 
Heaven awaits. That's even more motivation for doing things the gospel way. Interpersonal conflict between Christians can be resolved. Just summarizing these two points. When all the parties consider the others as more important than themselves and strive for unity. And when all the parties recognize that the gospel is more important than their disagreement about non-gospel issues. When that happens, the conflicts diminish because both parties are sitting on the same side of the table, focused on the same priorities, not focused on their own problems. Now, you may find help in other places for interpersonal conflict, but for a believer, there's no better place to turn than God's Word. And these verses offer sound and relevant solutions. This conflict has probably been going up for quite a while. Long enough for Paul to hear about it in prison and write this letter to address it. Long-term conflict wears on a church. The Philippians needed encouragement, and Paul reminds them of how to resolve this relationship. And in verse 4, he reminds them of their long-term goal. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Joy is the recurring theme of this epistle. Rejoice. Keep on rejoicing. And in this context, they could be, he be, could be reminding them, don't let this ongoing struggle keep you all from joy. We rejoice in the Lord. And when we rejoice in the Lord, we forget our problems and delight in His person. That's what joy does to us. Gerald Hawthorne says, his definition of joy, joy is a perception of a reality that generates hope and endurance in affliction and temptation and in ease and prosperity. Because joy allows one to see beyond any particular event, good or bad, to the sovereign Lord who stands above all events and ultimately has control over them. Perception of reality that generates hope beyond what's going on in our own lives because it focuses on the sovereign Lord who has control over the events of our life. Joy comes into our hearts when we view God in His wonder, no matter what. Behold our God. I don't want to spend too much time on verse 5, but I think it suggests another recurring problem that we need to mention. Verse 5 says, Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. Let me stop with that phrase. The word for gentle spirit, reasonableness, gentle, whatever you might have in your, in your translation, reasonable, reasonableness, gentleness, having a gentle spirit, it's very difficult to translate, obviously, because there's three different ways or four different ways to translate it. But I believe that the verse speaks to the problem of prevailing self-advancement. Paul says to the church that a gentle and reasonable person will not project his own feelings into a difficult situation. He will not push his own agenda. He will be gentle or she will be gentle and reasonable and meek of spirit. She'll have, she, this person, he or she will have a desire to get along. Paul is telling the members of the church to, don't, to uh, not let emotion control and escalate against these two women, for instance. You ladies have been at this long enough. That's it. Stop it. I'm tired of hearing all this stuff. I would never do that. Paul says, that's not the right spirit to have. Gentle spirit. Have calmness. Don't urge your own rights to the fullest. Yield to others. Let all men know your motive and desire is the growth and advancement of others. And, verse 5 ends, the Lord is near. That's not just a, not just like, like if I was writing something and I felt like I was being really harsh for a while, I'd stick in something like this, the Lord is near. That's not what's happening here. Let's think how this fits into this whole context. How many sins would we avoid, sins like interpersonal struggle that are caused by our own, our own carelessness, not, not being, being quick to speak. How many of sins and other sins would we avoid if we just remembered this? The Lord is near. It will be easy to yield to others when we remember that Jesus is near right now in spirit and is near in time physically. I think that's what Paul means. The Lord is near. He's, he's here now and His coming is near as well. So remember that as we're going through these problems Another prevailing problem that may develop 
from the first two is the problem of persistent anxiety. Problem of persistent anxiety. The Lord is near, verse 6 then begins, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Anxiety is, first of all, a problem with the mind. When we apply verse 6, verse 7 will happen. If we stop being anxious, then our minds will be controlled. Verse 7 is a promise. God's peace will guard our hearts. Our heart is our identity. That it's who we are. And guard our minds. It's the relationship of the mind to anxiety. Verse 8 gives a plan for getting our minds on course, thinking the right things we'll pick up there next week. But anxiety may affect our emotions and our physical well-being as well. However, the Bible says it's related to our thinking. In fact, the word anxious means to be of a divided, the, the, the original word here, anxious, means to be of a divided mind. And our English word worry comes from an English word meaning to strangle. Does that remind you of how you worry and what happens when you worry? We've all been there, I suppose. If you haven't, please share the rest of us what your, what your secret is. We throw back and forth. Is this the best way or is that the best way? Is this the right solution or is that the right solution? Should I do this or should I do that? So we feel strangled by doubt and fear. And most of that, we don't have enough information to resolve anyway. Let me get, uh, share with you a, 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 personal, a personal point here. I have called myself Senior Scenario because I do that. I create what-ifs and then try to resolve them. Sometimes I say, why in the world did I ever think of that? Where did that thought come from? Should I start a senior scenario club? I'm not sure. Maybe some of you, I'm looking at faces. Maybe some of you are there too. And that makes for a long night. And God has one thing to say about all this care, anxiety, and worry. Stop it. Don't be anxious. That's a command. Worry is our way of showing that we doubt God's sovereignty. We don't really trust Him. When we worry, we're trusting in ourselves for solutions, not God. When we worry, we're doubting the promises of God. Think about this. Where is God when you're in trouble? Where is God when you're anxious? I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a promise. Where is he when you're troubled? During the day or during the night? Or on the road? Or fixing the dinner? Or eating the dinner? Or anywhere? I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you start worrying about what's going to happen, you're not trusting God in that promise. Will God help you in your times of despair and care? He says, the Bible says, cast all your care on him because he cares for you. He cares for you. He's with you. I'm preaching to myself this morning too. These are the things that happen when we, when we don't trust God's promises, we go in the other direction. Did Jesus tell us not to worry? Did he say, only worry about the important things like food and clothing? Let me read for you Matthew 6, 25 and following. Jesus' words, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And then he gives this physical reminder. I think Jesus is sitting there on the, sermon, on the mountain giving this sermon and birds fly over and he uses them for an illustration. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? Isn't that interesting? Do you ever think that worry will keep you alive longer? It's probably shortening your life. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. 
and they do not toil, nor do they spin. The last verse is, so do not worry about tomorrow, verse 34, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Philippians 4, 6 agrees. Don't be filled with care about anything. Don't keep asking questions for which the answers are unavailable. Why did this happen? What is God doing? How will it turn out? If you don't know the answers, wait. If you don't know what to do, wait. That doesn't mean we shouldn't deal with life issues. But we should not let worry about those issues squeeze the joy and hope out of us, which is what worry will always do. Stop worrying. That's it, huh? You say, well, that doesn't seem to work for me. Well, there's more here. Stop worrying is just part of the equation. First point is decide not to worry, and what will replace worry? Well, the rest of the verse is determined to keep praying. Stop worrying and keep praying. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. But here, this word but is the strongest possible contrast available. These two things are in utter opposition. Care and prayer are as opposite as fire and water. Don't worry. Keep praying. You really can't do both at the same time. I've tried. It doesn't work. And I'll explain why. But whenever anxiety comes to mind, you should pray. Paul uses four words to describe prayer. The first word prayer is the general term for all, all kinds of prayer. Everything related to prayer is captured in this first term and everything by prayer. And then there's supplication or petition. That word is rooted in the idea of lacking something, to be without. Certainly not having something you need could cause worry. And Jesus said, the things you really need, food and clothing, he'll take care of. One of the things that I think is uh, one of our most needed things, especially in time of, of stress, James 1 calls wisdom. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally. That should be in our, in our prayer of supplication. Lord, give me wisdom. And here's this promise. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Wisdom is one of my... Uh, is one of my most often uttered prayers. Lord, give me wisdom. Pray with thanksgiving. I believe this is the missing element in most prayers, not just prayers in time of need. And it's not because we don't ever thank God. I believe, that's, I, I believe we thank God. But I think sometimes we miss some of the things for which we should be thankful. God brought us to the situation we're in for his purposes, and it might not be pleasant, but he's with us and cares for us, and we should thank him for that. Singer-songwriter wrote, uh, David Meese wrote this song some years ago. Here's what he said. I had a lot of dreams that never came true, things I could have done but never got the chance to do. When I couldn't see the path of the storm, your wisdom wouldn't let me go that way, and it broke my heart but now my heart can say, thank you for the times you said no. Thank you for the doors that you closed. All the ways you never let me go and the things you never gave me. So many times I didn't understand, but now I want to fall at your feet and thank you for the things you never gave me. When I wanted less than what you had in mind. When I wanted more than I could handle at the time. When I needed you but turned you away. You wouldn't let me slip out of your hand. I just didn't know, but now I understand. Thank you for the times you said no. Thank you for the doors that you closed, all the things you never let me go, all the ways you never let me go, and the things you never gave me. Laura Story wrote uh, a song that's been played much in the last several years about her own personal trauma. And in the song, she says... What if your blessings come through raindrops? What if your healing comes through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to, draw, to know you're near? 
What if trials of this life are your blessings in disguise? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, in everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Thank God that he is near. Thank God that he's sovereign. Thank God that Jesus will return as a savior, verse 321 told us. And notice how prayer effectively changes our focus. We're stressed out in worry. Our world has shrunk to the size of our concern. It's all we can see. We begin to pray. We trust God to supply the things we need. We thank God for the things He provides. And then we pray specifically a financial need, an interpersonal problem, a sickness, a job issue, whatever is the issue of concern. And so now we're no longer talking to ourselves in this period of time. But we've brought God into the problem. Remember the disciples on the sea when the horrific storm came? And they're struggling. These fishermen, these seasoned fishermen having seen storms before had never seen anything quite like this and where's Jesus he's sleeping in the boat right they're full of fear and worry they came to him and woke him saying save us Lord we're perishing he said to them why are you afraid you men of little faith then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea and it became perfectly calm the men were amazed and said what kind of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him things change when they got brought when they brought Christ into the picture There's only one thing that's more awesome than a storm outside the boat, and that's having God in the boat. Bring God into your boat. Stop worrying about things you cannot control, things you don't know, situations you cannot change. Pray with thanksgiving. And verse 7 is the absolute assurance that your commitment to stop worrying will bring indescribable peace. Listen to this. And the peace of God, it follows along. If you do this, if if you... If you're not anxious and you pray, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Notice there's no waiting for answers here. He doesn't say pray and then wait for the answer and and maybe then peace will come. He says pray and the peace will come. That's important, I think. Because sometimes we like, well, okay, God, here's what I'm praying for. You know, when when it gets here, I'll, I'll see how I respond. You pray and ask And then peace will come. We don't need to know how God will answer before we experience His peace. And most of the time, we don't know how God will answer. God's peace is greater than our fear and anxiety. It will overrule our negative emotions. When we worry, we're divided in mind. We can't figure things out. Well, we can't figure out God's peace either. It's beyond comprehension. Isn't that wonderful? I don't get it, Lord, but thanks. I had this this happen for me this week. Situation I was praying about. I put aside the scenarios and just said, okay, God, you take over. I got the next morning wasn't even on my mind. That's not me. Because I told you, I'm the guy that figures things out or tries to. This is how God's peace works. And I I went, wow. I can't believe it settled in my mind. God's peace is like a guardhouse. It will will guard your heart and your mind. It's like a fortress. Philippi was a Roman outpost. Remember we talked about that. They were proud of that. They were proud of their Romans. So these Christians knew about military security. They knew how tightly Paul was, was chained up and locked up in prison in Rome as well. In the same way, God's peace will guard our hearts and minds so tightly that worry cannot penetrate. That's an unexplainable action. A friend of mine in New Hampshire had entered a canoe race and he had a young man as his partner. It was, kind of, it was an easy race, shallow water, only one small section of rapids. And things were going well for the both of them until they hit that spot where the rapids were. The canoe capsized and started drifting downstream away from them, so naturally they grabbed the canoe, which is 
over, turned over now. They tried to turn it back over. This is quite a scene for people on the shore. Here's these two very large men standing in shallow water, fighting with a lightweight canoe. Trying to keep their balance as the current swept against them. And as they struggled, they heard a voice from the shore saying, Let go of the canoe! They thought it was the silliest thing they ever heard. How are we going to finish the race if we don't have the canoe? And they kept fighting and fighting and fighting. And the boys yelled out again, let go of the canoe. And others joined in the appeal. Everybody inside on the, on the shore saying, let go of the canoe, let go of the canoe. Finally, they just gave up and let go of the canoe. The river carried it a little while, a little farther ahead, out of the rushing stream and to a peaceful side next to the shore. They easily got back into the canoe and finished the race. God is calling us to let go of the canoe. Let go of the canoe. In your struggle and worry, quit hanging on. We may, we may not understand that sometimes. Thinking that we have to work things out. It's my job. But when we release our grip on our worries and let Him carry us through, our course will be manageable and full of God's unnatural peace. Father, we, uh, we read these things, we get an understanding of them, and we know that, uh, that it's beyond us sometimes in our own to deal with such things. And yet you have promised that when we stop worrying and keep praying, you will bring peace. Thank you for the times we've experienced that, and the many times more we will. Help us to remember this image of Jesus being in the boat and of us letting go of that to let him steer us to peaceful waters. Thank you for your promises and your goodness to us. In Jesus' name, amen.